last time we saw uh, the basic motivations for why we have to treat gauge field theories carefully. So as we know, the quantization goes through canonical structure. And we saw that uh, pi 0 a are all equal to 0 for any gauge field. So right in the notation in the notation that the gauge potentials are written as a mu a t a and t a are generators. I think no. So this pi zero just means that for the the conjugate to a zero uh, are all zero, all the internal group index uh, the at in that joint representation. We also saw that uh, in many a sense the A0 are also 0 so a so called uh, Coulomb gauge The Lorentz gauge is almost always imposed and it is a class of gauges. Which is simply that uh, d mu a mu equal to 0. And here we would have to say covariant derivative that is right. So this is from abelian course. So in the electromagnetism we said this equal to 0 uh, and in non abelian case so this is a covariant gauge. And within it, one further puts the restriction that A0 are equal to 0. So the Coulomb gauge which is a subclass further imposes that A0, A are all equal to 0 uh, equivalently A0 equal to 0. 
which leaves behind uh, di of ai equal to 0. Now this we can see is a essentially a space derivative, there is no time involved except that it is a differential condition, uh, it involves derivatives of fields, it is, it, they are only space derivatives, so it is at a particular time. So if you actually think of uh, taking derivatives as taking difference of fields at nearby points, it is just a condition on uh, values of fields at a on a particular time like surface, right. So if t is going this way, we have some domain in the space like part and we are just saying that this has to be imposed here on a particular time like slice. So you could in principle invert this and find out and just replace so you can solve for this and put it permanently in the dynamics and not have to worry about it later. So in principle can be solved not that you will do it in practice well actually it is done also I should not say so in but I do not want to get into too much of the detailed formalism can be solved for AI uh, in terms of space like Green's function for the Laplacian. This is of course a covariant gauge covariant Laplacian. And thus retain only physical degrees of freedom. So I will give this as exercise. which hopefully everybody who has been noting the exercise please email me tonight. So I will try to put it in the Moodle and in some exercise sheet ok. And there is actually a nice reference I will from that uh, Nair's, Parmeshwaran Nair's book a few what two pages you have to read ok. So that is one way but it is a bit cumbersome and uh, ultimately it has to do with very specific gauge. So the general approach is to recall what we were doing last time that there exists. So what is the general lesson? We had that there are some coordinates that can be superfluous, further there can be also uh, space like differential conditions on the fields. So we note that there are constraints in the phase space. which can be taken care of by imposing gauge conditions. So 
So we say that C A of Q P equal to 0 are conditions are uh, constraints and some gamma A of Q P are gauge conditions. The requirement that the imposition gamma A takes care of the condition C A and leaves behind only canonical independent set. So, we went through this last time. So, recall from last time things like uh, what did we say C A new canonical variables. which are you treat the C A as some coordinates and then Q star uh, Q n minus n star as the coordinates. and some p1, p2, pn and then p1 star pn minus n star as the uh, conjugate momenta where p i are found by inverting gamma A of written in this language, right, new variables. So, you have to invert these and find from them the p1 to pn. There will of course be a equal to 1 to n. Okay. There will be as many conditions as there are constraints and that will be that many constraints. So, a, a runs from 1 to n here. Not to be confused with the a of the gauge fields, but they are going to become the same in the end. This is more general discussion. Right. So, this is sort of formal, we do not know how exactly you are going to do it, but we assume that it is doable. Then we know that then the true we can construct physical vacuum to vacuum amplitude as a path integral only over the true variables. Well, so yeah put a j there and then we can say i s plus integral of q 
क्यू ऑल द डायनेमिकल वेरिएबल्स राइट क्यू स्टार टाइम्स जे इज so that would be the vacuum to vacuum amplitude so you would modify it appropriately by introducing sources and so on right so but this doesn't all i mean the, because the detail is not my point what we are going to do is in practice this is not what we do so what we do is so i think we were writing the external current uh, language only for uh, phi version without the pi pi having been integrated out so that's why I got uh, concerned about the notation but here we want to retain both phi and pi so what we do is we so let me return to phi pi language or well we can continue to write this so we write omega plus omega minus as integral over all the dqs and all the dps but what we do is introduce a delta function of the gauge conditions and we also need to restrict the p's so we want to restrict the p's such that the gamma a are uh, set to zero times x i s of so I'm q's and p's now there is a simple argument that says that this uh, right and what we need to do is the imposition of gamma a is as good as saying so yeah so we in fact write this is integral over the q star p star then d of c if you like
So, we pretend that we made this canonical transformation from the old u p to the the symbolic ones and the the formulae p minus f is whatever you get from inverting the statement gamma a equal to 0. So, call this thing uh, well we already use star somewhere, but so this is so uh, this equation ok. So, where f a equal to 0 is a rather so this equal yeah so p a equal to f a that is what this means yeah. p a equal to f a of all these fields there is c and there is gamma but gamma is equal is being set equal to 0. So, think of this as the formal inversion of the conditions gamma a equal to 0 I think this is enough to write. And so, we are imposing that here. The thing to remember now was that in order that this transformation does actually distangle the constrained and the unconstrained things correctly is that the Poisson bracket of C A and gamma A has to be non-zero. So, in a sense they remain they, they would after due rearrangement of the gammas into p's into this p equal to f a, the f a would become conjugate to the c a. So, that requirement was that the gamma a and c a have a non-zero Poisson bracket. Or well, yeah, equal to zero. Uh, it not equal to zero. Very sorry. Right. So that they remain the as a matrix treated when treated as a matrix treated as an array. Labeled by A and B or in other words the determinant of this should not be equal to 0. Somewhere we said this uh, right. So, this is same as yeah. So, being the same as determinant of well you can work out this Poisson bracket it is same as d gamma by d p. Not equal to 0 what is happening to me here right. So, so that for the invertibility the inversion requires that this has to this determinant has to be non zero and which ties in with our need that they become canonically conjugate to each th that some combinations of them can be made into mutually canonical we now argue that the d 
डी पी डी डेल्टा फंक्शन इज द सेम एज एन इक्वेलेंट डेल्टा फंक्शन इंटीग्रल ओवर द गामाज well this is not what we so we stipulate that that this that because the p's are found from just inverting the statements about gammas so this would be true up to this is in the functional space it would be true up to some overall constants right which are not important so you can take it as a stipulation where we assume that the gammas can be normalized correctly or some overall norm so that this can work out correctly okay so up to a the point is that whatever that adjustable factor is is not dependent on the phase space so let me write it here i should tell you though that all this is uh, all this is a way of justifying to oneself what one is doing and some of these things may have uh, strange flaws these arguments are slick but they may have flaws and in fact there is this thing called gribo ambiguity which you should try to read on your own so they may not always be quite correct but turns out that so people do identify them and then fix them later and so on but for the time being we assume that this works the, the gribo problem by the way has never been completely resolved but people just live with it so uh yeah so this is if we assume this stipulation then we claim that this uh, delta of pa minus fa can then be taken to be times this determinant d gamma by dp the jacobian by right, transferring the measure here so we can equivalently think of this was some measure times some distribution so equivalently we take this to be the jacobian of the transformation but we have the phase space no so whatever you do in the coordinate side there is an implication for the uh, momenta side so in other words we have uh, so this logic is correct right that i have ca equal to 0 emerging from analyzing the equations and i realize some of it is not dynamical so i say that oh that means i have to uh, put this constraint and then to say that so 
the gauge condition is something independent of it. So, this is the picture I tried to draw last time and uh, failed. I do not know whether I will succeed this time. So, there is some constraint surface. And what we want is that uh, the genuine path integral does not end up traversing this surface. Because if you in integral, because these are all equivalent, only one of them is a representative member. So, you somehow want to impose a gauge condition that picks out a trajectory that cuts this only once. So, at least in this way where all the fashionably drawn many axes restricted to three dimensional. So, it would have to be the co-dimension of the C A. So, this is the condition gamma A. So, if the condition gamma A is such that it cuts this C A only once, but does cut it which is what makes the determinant non-zero, then they are not independent. Then it will be, so this is the geometric picture. Now that you have the picture, you do this clever set of arguments to convert these into canonical variables, mutually canonical by finding F A which invert the gamma A and then declare them to be the conjugates of this C A equal to 0, yeah, very good. So, what am I thinking? Um, so, the trajectory, the yes, so the identical copies are perpendicular to this. So, there are lot of these which are the redundant ones. So, that equal, you could have set instead of 0, you could have set 5 or something, which would all be equivalent and uh, one has to, right. So, let us think of specifically, we said, so if I had the A mu's, let us just say there is A 0, A 1 and A 3, A 2 and we set A 0 equal to 0, it means that I am restricted to remain in the a 1, A 2 plane. To do that, I well in this case of course, it is trivial, but in principle what it requires to do is to impose the gauge condition that is uh, sorry, because this is not a constraint, this already is the gauge condition. We have to say divergence A equal to 0 and uh, sorry. So, the gauge invariance was gauge transformations take you within a particular set of that is what I meant here that gauge transformations would leave you within this. I think this is correct picture, but we can discuss it later ok, uh, because right now I am in the another flow of thought. So, but I just want to answer at least algebraically without the picture which I right now do not remember how it works, but that we are trying to convert the existence of constraints and the gauge conditions we place to repair them. Yeah, so the con gauge condition was divergence p equal to 0, dive pi or which is same as divergence e equal to 0. And to take care of that, the gauge condition was divergence A was equal to 0 within the Lorentz gauge. So, these are the two things that are uh, proposed to be made mutually canonical, ok. So, so there is a geometric picture of what the constraints and the gauge conditions are and then there is the canonical picture where you try to move from the geometric picture to the canonical picture. And in the process you claim that 
imposing the delta function for these uh, formal p's that were meant to invert gamma. So, the great advantage of this is that uh, we actually get rid of the p's completely in the end. So, we now answer that this is same as the determinant of the Poisson bracket. And we thus get rid of the superfluous P's which were placeholders to think through this thing, ok. We need the matrix M A B which is variation of the gauge condition with respect to the gauge transformation that is what this boils down to. So, for example, for example, we had the gauge condition divergence E equal to 0, right. And but under gauge transformation, E tilde equal to uh, old E minus d a d t. One moment, one moment, what will be seen? Uh, we are talking about transformations of A. So, uh, right, A tilde are equal to old A minus d lambda by dt, right. God, I can only remember the covariance statement. So, A tilde equal to A mu minus D mu lambda, right. So, right. So, and for the non abelian case, it is D mu. So, for no, let me write the abelian case and then the non abelian one as we struggled and realized one day delta a mu is equal to d mu of to the leading order is same as d mu of lambda a. So, it has d mu plus f a b c.
So even the infinitesimal one has the imprint of non-abelian gauge transformation. Actually, this is why this uh, Gribov ambiguity arises. So, since we have said A0 already equal to 0, note that divergence E or let us write Di of Fi0 is equal to Di of Ai uh, D, uh, right, D, uh, Di of A0. Uh, sorry, D0 of Ai, right, because the others are all 0. The A0 is 0. So, there is probably with a minus sign, right, and let us put in the gauge index. So, the electric field is dA by E equal to, which is what I started writing, dA by dt minus grad phi but the phi a0 we have set equal to 0. So, basically it is this and uh, and therefore, if you this is the gauge condition, okay, this is C. So, varying C with respect to the gauge condition means that you have to calculate this ok. So, now you put the that is same as di of minus d0 of delta a i a by delta lambda b. So, that is equal to di of minus d0 of, now we are varying this with respect to this. So, there will be d uh, and mu somewhere, right. So, after all these are, uh, so a i is what I have to write, a i a. So, there will be um, d i of, right, the and then delta a b and the delta 3 of or delta 4 of the arguments of f and arguments of this. So, we have to be now careful about this x and say y. So, this matrix, uh, this is a gigantic matrix ok, it is not just these labels, but also their coordinate labels. So, it is going to be delta 4 of x minus y right. The delta i b can of course, come out, but this will be delta i of x will act on this delta function and then plus f a b c a mu b and uh, delta c b and again delta 4 of x minus y. So, that is the formal expression for what this d c by d lambda is. So, I went through this in great detail because that is that crystallizes what all this fancy uh, abstract reasoning. So, 
in practice of course any good physicist would have done all suffered all this first and then said i have a clean picture you know then you say i am dirac there are constraints and there are first class constraints and second class constraints and there is canonical structure on the space of constraints etc but this is what the grange calculation boils down to so this is the determinant you will need to insert in the path integral to make sense of it now this was uh, observed by feynman in his own way without suffering all this but suffering other things by in practice looking at what the diagrams needed etc and that by in trying to impose gauge condition uh, you had to remove some of the diagrams so so we now claim that our wj yes so right and these are all star if you like only the real ones remain now sorry i'm very sorry uh, un unrestricted unrestricted yeah so these are the full set because we have put in the constraints times e raised to i times action uh, and plus i times integral j dot j dot a so now we are stuck with this delta function and uh, there is another series of tricks which then gets you to fadio popo answer one of the tricks is that the simpler trick is to rewrite so uh, yeah simpler trick is to rewrite uh, alternative argument for the above in ramon's book which is actually quite popular with lot of people it introduces some formal thing called delta c inverse which is equal to integral d over gauge field space of delta of uh, yeah ca that's it okay so one should go through this to see there's another formal elegant argument which also leads to the same answer it's the same in spirit but done a bit differently so we deal with this delta function of c in a slightly trivial way and it's simpler of the two problems one is that uh, think of so
so reinterpreting or rewriting delta of c. So, here we claim that think of this as C A of the canonical variables minus some constants okay, which do not depend on the you do not need a 0 pi 0. So, at, at this point let me say that I am just writing a this did not even have uh, well. So, up to that point it did not even have to be gauge field theory it just says some constraints and some this. In Dirac's language when you convert the C gamma language to the canonical language the second class constraints which can be explicitly eliminated will not appear and this will remain only on the first class constraints ok. So, the a 0 and pi 0 are not required. So, we can also say that So, all this is only dealing with the first class constraints, ones that cannot be trivially set to 0 or solved for. In fact, if you will read the slightly lengthy discussion in Ramon's book, he does. So, for the abelian case, you can get by without doing these technical things because you actually just invert the gauge condition dive a equal to 0 uh, do in the coulomb gauge you just get an awkward looking long expression which is end of the story no determinant to be solved for you explicitly solve and stuff it in so then you only have two variables to integrate over so here the the more superfluous one the second class one doesn't even appear anymore and it is the second one that is one is trying to do and uh, by the way this argument which is the alternative one basically says that we want to get rid of superfluous integrations over gauge copies of A. So, effectively you have to factor out the volume of the gauge group ok except that it is function of x. So, the gauge group functional or gauge uh, yeah gauge gauge valued u valued u of x gauge gauge transformation. So, it is that which is being removed for that you do not uh, the superfluous one can be assumed to be already gone and then you remove the gauge volume for the remaining gauge condition. So, to deal with this one then says Yeah, just once let me finish writing this. Okay. 
Yes. Yes. Uh, no, pi is uh, yeah, pi 0 equal to 0 was second class constraint, yes. So, a 0 is the corresponding variable, pi 0 equal to 0 is the constraint and the corresponding variable you take as a 0 and you throw them away together. It is a gauge choice, but it is so trivial that you can kind of throw it away together. No, no longer required in gamma. So, the C A gamma A language you take to apply only to the first class constraints, which cannot be trivially removed. Yes. So, what we note is that look at this formal integration, this g is some function of x. Integral dg of delta function of C A minus G A times this Gaussian stuck in is just equal to replacing wherever I see G by C's. So, it becomes this, but we note that this whole expression uh, which is a Gaussian integral is at best, so is at best giving you some answer which is not dependent on canonical variables. So, this uh, right. So, if you look at this answer is some Gaussian, right. It is determinant of let us say what, what I mean multiple of square root of alpha at infinite number of points in space and time. So, it is some constant. So, we take this expression which is a constant and multiply it to this where we shift the C A by this constant without affecting the Jacobian of the this integral, okay. So, the big functional integral is going to maybe accumulate some Jacobian again which is not going to depend on the canonical variables. So, I went in reverse. So, think of this as firstly you do this transformation. So, this is this is 1, this is 2 and 1 this and So, if you believe these two that this is nothing but some constant similarly shifting C A actually does not cost you anything in this functional integral. Then you first shift the C A do the number two steps first then multiply on the left by this ok. Now, you do a G integral. So, this is step 3. you do it in this order. One, two and three in reverse actually. Okay, so, note that shifting this by some constant some uh, C number function not a canonical variable did not cost anything. Also, we multiply by an overall Gaussian which is not going to change canonical variable answer. Then we basically note that after doing that manipulation, I can carry out the G integral and replace my delta function of C by 
this Gaussian version, Gaussian version of it. Now, why is that good? Because instead of having to interpret some formal delta function over some condition in the phase space, we have replaced the phase space expressions in the same line as the action functional. And if the CA are typically linear in the variables, then we just have added some quadratic terms in the effective action. Okay. So, by okay so that is not so bad so it just makes it life more convenient Yeah, but who cares? We are not worrying about the value of the integral. So, let me remind you of the other main philosophy why all this very uh, sleight of hand works. As I was saying in the very beginning, all of these are fortunately not any numbers you are calculating. What I tried to emphasize was the path integral or the functional approach is never a very useful tool for doing quantum mechanics or chemistry. It is primarily a tool for deriving identities and relationships between Green's functions. And so, it is its symbolic dependence on the canonical variables that is all that matters. It is not meant to actually give you any numbers. So, if you have infinite factors multiplying it, it does not really matter. Eventually, you will vary and you are also going to divide by, you know, when you take expectation value of something, it will be equal to insertion of this, but divided by the thing without any insertions. So, all the infinite volumes are going to cancel out. So, if it overall changes any numerically the numbers, we do not care about it. It will, in this stack of things I was drawing, instead of being this surface, it will become some other surface. That is all it will do. The Identities that you will derive by say you are calculating some operators by doing integral O O divided by integral, these things won't change, those relationships won't change. It is actually meant to derive relationships between operators or observables in uh, or I mean identities between eventual observables, even Green's functions are not directly used as observables, you convert it to S matrix in the end. But those things are not going to be affected by these manipulations. 
So, the path integral itself, the functional integral itself does not actually calculate anything, but it represents the, it shows that the dependence on the canonical variables is essentially Gaussian exponential or exponential of whatever the expression is, but that is all it really captures. So, these are in the, gen, uh, it, there, these are as it is called generating functional, it is basically a generating functional of uh, various identities and not itself any value of any numerical value to be calculated. So, this will be replaced by this which is nice, we got rid of one delta function. The other one has a really bizarre story and which is where the Russians come in and we will only start it today and, and complete it next time. So, rewriting delta of d c by d lambda. So, here clever people observed that uh, I mean the only good thing we can do here is Gaussian integrals. This is what however illegal we have all accepted as friends that we can do Gaussian integrals. So, what Gaussian integral can give you a determinant? So, of course, you are very clever. So, you know that uh, determinant can be got by doing. So, if I had a multivariate Gaussian, and then dxi this gaussian is 1 over square root of determinant a so we got a determinant but heck it's a square root and in the denominator so we say okay we can do a little better that is effectively secretly bringing in two variables. So, it actually becomes determinant of A. But now, this silly thing is in the denominator, but we want it in the numerator. So, there was this man Berezin So, Grassmann variables are the things that are anti commuting. whatever the thetas are, they are not numbers. Okay. So, and there is some multiplication among them. So, there is some kind of an algebra, some kind of variables called theta, some number of them i equal to 1 to n and some multiplication defined over them.
a binary operation. We make up the, we invent a calculus for this. So, we are reaching 7 o'clock. So, let me first tell you the answer. Then a, cal then a calculus can be invented. such that integral d theta i d theta i star e raised to a i j theta i theta j star is equal to determinant of a in the numerator. So, but anyway just to also jump to the answer, if we do this, then using this we can rewrite this as, okay I do not need to, so continuation of that. Then we can d lambda b be replaced by as we worked out in that example it's a it's a complicated uh, expression usually right but it can be found So, it will become a function of x and y and we will have some delta functions in a and b. So, this is what happens. So, you replace in the end that determinant also by something which again as you may imagine if the c's are essentially linear in the canonical variables then this variation will at best produce because the covariant derivative is after all sort of quadratic in the is it will with some residual a this m a b will be again at best quadratic in a ok it will be something functional of a but new variables eta and uh, eta b which are anti commuting complex complex anti commuting variables over which you have to do the integral the advantage is yeah so we will see the mathematics of that next next time but the advantage of this is that we then interpret the etas as if they are uh, anti commuting complex scalars
well I complex is not so crucial. So, fermionic Lorentz scalars. which basically means that their loops loops have overall minus sign and um, their kinetic term so to speak gets decided from here because recall that A B times some derivatives of delta 4 of x minus y. So, which produces the kinetic terms. Usually looking exactly like it is a Dirac spinner, you know, eta bar d i. Okay, so yeah, C bar D C and well, it didn't have to be multiplied by A. Yeah, actually, just uh, D box box, right? So it becomes box. What? Yeah, it's like a scalar, of course. Yeah, so not fermionic. So it is. So it will give some scalar-like kinetic term to them, but they have to be treated as fermions because they are anti-commuting. And the good thing is that your genuine fermions, electrons, etc., have to be dealt with also by Bereshin integral only. So, and if you do it, then you actually recover QED Feynman rules. Of course, nobody actually bothers to do QED by that method because it is easy to quantize more directly. But if you did, then uh, <coughs> it will give you the correct answer. The eta are called ghosts. Well, uh, appear in the calculation and have 
the wrong statistics. are called ghosts. 